Psalms chapter number 9. Psalms chapter 9. Turn with me there and uh, we'll look over a few verses here as we uh, try to mind the Lord as we continue to go through the Old Testament looking at types of Christ. And I mentioned already the book of Psalms is a little bit unique when it comes to types of Christ. There are what we uh, know, what we call Messianic Psalms. Uh, Messianic Psalms, and uh, they deal with Christ, they deal with His reign, they deal uh, with His ministry, and, and a lot of different things, and, and you'll see those as we go through. There are some that are very obvious, there are some that are listed pretty well by every Bible student as uh, those type of Psalms. And then there are Psalms of praise, there's Psalms of prayer, there's uh, Psalms of uh, I guess, cries, if you will, uh, solemn psalms where someone is crying out to the Lord. And, uh, but in many of the psalms, as you go through there, whether they're dealing specifically with the ministry of Christ, where it, whether it is a prophetic passage that is pointing to, I mean, if you get over to Psalms chapter, uh, Psalms 22 and get in some areas like that, there's some pictures there that are, that are very obvious, very detailed, and we'll get to those. But there's other Psalms that uh, as you read them, you see an overall picture. There might not be a blatant painting on the wall. But as you go through there is a theme that you get to pick up. We were in a hotel in Culpeper, Virginia the last couple of nights. And um, it's, uh, the Culpeper is a very big equestrian area. And they got a lot of horse farms, a lot of horse events, a lot of equestrian events. Uh, in fact, that's the city where Christopher Reeve had his um, horse accident when he came over the top, broke his neck. Um, so that's just that area. And uh, you would go through one area and there may be a large painting on the wall of a horse and a rider, a racer and a jumper and things of that nature. And it was very obvious that this was an equestrian uh, centered place. But then there were other areas you'd go through as you'd walk down the hall and it may just be a little statue of a horse. It may just be a, a, a little uh, event flyer or just a little news clipping that was somewhere. It's not nearly as dramatic. And really, most people walking through would not even see it and tie it to the fact that this was an equestrian area. But if you were paying attention, you would see there was a theme that carried throughout all of the hotel and the restaurant and everything around there that carried that same thing. Well, I guess the book of Psalms is that way. Some Psalms will get into it as like a mural on the wall. It goes from one end to the other. There's no missing it. Amen. If you miss it, it's because you walk through it with your eyes closed and the lights off. But there are some psalms as we go through that you're just going to pick up some themes that lead you to understand what the, the theme of that chapter is. And I think that's what we've got here. We don't have a blatant picture in Psalms chapter number 9 or a, what I would consider a vibrant, a vibrant picture. Uh, but I believe there's a theme here that I want to draw our attention to as we go through this particular book. Stand with me if you will. We'll read all 20 verses. And uh, we'll bring the message the Lord's put on my heart. The Bible said in verse number one, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. My, when mine enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish to thy presence. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou saddest in the throne judging right. Thou hast rebuked the heathen, thou hast destroyed the wicked, thou hast put out their name forever and ever. O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end, and thou hast destroyed cities, their memorial is perished with them. But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in time of times of trouble. And they that know thy name, will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. Uh, he forgetteth not the cry of the humble. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou that liftest me up 
from the gates of, of death, that I may show forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in thy salvation. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made. In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Higion, Selah. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Selah. Heavenly Father, I pray your blessings upon the reading of your word. I ask you, Lord, to give us clarity in our thought, clarity in our words. Lord, would you put a gate upon my lips? Let me say everything I ought to say and nothing I shouldn't. Lord, feed us from your word for just a little bit. As we look into this, as we see pictures of the judgment of God, I pray, Lord, that we would also see the Savior and that our hearts would rejoice. For once, Lord, we realize we were under condemnation. We stood one day to be judged as a sinner. But I want to thank you that you saved me and put me in the family of God. I know, Lord, I will still stand before you in judgment judgment one day, but it will not be as a sinner. And I bless your name for that. Help us as we go into your word and we'll bless you and thank you for all you do in Jesus name. Amen. And amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I'm going to bring your attention to four different things as we just break down this chapter. We'll divide it four different places. And uh, then we'll go over to the New Testament, to the book of John in just a little bit and uh, try to give you some verses that hope will bring a little clarity as to what we're trying to say tonight. The psalmist here, uh, the Bible says this is a psalm of David. Of course, many of these are. And uh, this is a song that, psalm that starts off with a great deal of praise. In fact, the first division that we'll give you tonight in verse number one and two, we'll call that the jubilation of the writer. Uh, David, you'll find in many of his psalms, starts out, and it may very be, a, a, be a very negative psalm, as some of them are. In fact, if you were to take this and take all of the positive verses out of this chapter, and leave all the negative verses, it wouldn't shrink the chapter a lot. There, there's some, uh, what the world, I guess, would consider very negative. In fact, if you've never been saved, this would be a negative chapter to read. It's primarily about the judgment of God. And it's about the judgment of the Lord and how he judges righteously. Can I tell you, if you've never been saved by God's grace, that, that is the last thing you want is to be judged rightly. Amen. I remember one time down at Dawson County Jail, we were in there. I had no idea who the inmate was, but we were taking up prayer requests. And uh, we, as we often did, and we were going down the line, and men were asking prayer for family members and asking family or a prayer for situations that were going on. And uh, some were asking prayer for salvation for friends and different things. And one particular man stood up or he raised his hand. He said, I want you to pray that I get justice. And another fellow sitting beside him said, hold on, don't pray that for me. I want you to pray. I get mercy. <laughs> Amen. I, I like that. Amen. One inmate knew why he was there. The other one, I don't, I think the other one probably knew why he was there, but not come to grips with it just yet. And uh, so he wanted justice. He wanted to be vindicated. He wanted what was right in his own eyes. But if he had looked at the law, probably he would be crying out for mercy as the other inmate was. And can I tell you, if I read this and I read about the judgment of God and his righteous judgment, we'll get to it in a moment, um, th then that would be very difficult for me to handle if I did not know I was saved by the grace of God. Because salvation is what brought me out from under the condemnation that sin had brought me under. So this rider, the jubilation of the rider in verse number two, first I want you to notice it was a fully committed jubilation. Notice the Bible said, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. That's something that not many Christians ever get to. I believe that's something not many of the people of God ever get to the place where we are willing or able to praise the Lord with our whole heart. Think about what that means. That means there is nothing else in your life at that moment that is taking anything else from your worship and praise of the Lord. How often do we come to the house of God and have absolutely nothing else on our mind and our heart and we come in to worship and praise the Lord with our whole heart? 
And I would dare say that many of you, and, and myself included, uh, there, there have been many times we have praised the Lord with three quarters of our heart. And it's pretty good, isn't it? I mean, if we worshiped and praised the Lord with three quarters of our heart, we would walk out and we would skip across the parking lot, say, man, what a service we've been in. That's with three quarters. I, I, will, I believe, Brother Titus, I could say this. There have been a handful of times in my life, I'm, I must confess, it's only been a handful. I wish I could tell you it was a multitude of times. I wish I could tell you every time I praised the Lord had been like this. But I, I believe looking back over my life, there are a handful of times I can say that I worshiped and praised the Lord with my whole heart. And it is an entirely different situation, an entirely different circumstance, an entirely different feeling when you leave a service and you know you have worshipped Lord, you have disconnected from the world, you've disconnected from your circumstances, you've disconnected from everything around you, and you have praised the Lord with every fiber of your heart. There wasn't a crevice that He did not have. There wasn't a crevice or a crater in your heart that was not lifting up praise and adoration to the Savior, I say not many children of God ever get there, but if you ever do, you remember it. Amen. Amen. If you've ever been there, I promise you, you can recall the time and you remember the experience. So it was a fully committed jubilation. Secondly, it was a fully communicated jubilation. He said, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. He said, this praise isn't just for me. This is not just something that I'm going to enjoy. Now, I believe in private worship. I believe in private prayer and private praise. And in fact, you've heard me say this. If you are going to praise and worship the Lord publicly, I believe you must first learn to do it privately. Because if you can never do it privately, you are not depending on what God has done for you. You're depending on what God's done for someone else. And we've been in services where you hear what God's done for someone else and man, all of a sudden that starts stirring you. And then somebody else stands up and God's done something for them and that stirs you and it goes throughout there and all of a sudden, man, you have enjoyed so much what God has done for everyone else that now you are getting in and you're beginning to worship. Wait a second. When it's just you and the Lord, there's no other testimony. There's nobody else prodding you. There's no one else to depend upon. It's you and the Lord. It's private worship. It's private praise. And if we ever get to that place, I don't believe public praise will be a problem. Amen. But I don't think there's a lot of private praise. If we brought down our own lives, myself included, how often would I find myself privately praising and worshiping the Lord? Would you not agree it's awful hard to worship Him privately? Amen. Wouldn't you agree that's difficult? Number one, one reason, I think probably the most prominent reason why it's so difficult is a time factor. It takes a little while to worship the Lord. You're not going to do it in two minutes on your way to get ready to work. Amen. You say, oh, I, I worship the Lord while my coffee makes. Problem is, you got a Keurig. <laughs> Amen. And it takes you a whole 30 seconds to get a cup of coffee. And that's the extent of our worship. You say, well, I took some time and worshiped the Lord while I made my cup of coffee. And man, we and the Lord, we just had a good time. We, how are you going to get disconnected from the world and connected to the heavenly world in 30 seconds of making coffee? I think time is probably one of the greatest factors that hinders our private worship. You say, well, come into church and worship publicly. That's easy. I know it's easy. You've already allotted. We're going to get there at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. We're going to be there until 1230 or 1 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. We're going to go back at 6 o'clock on Sunday evening. We're going to be there till 730 or last Sunday, 8, 830, 9 o'clock, whatever time it was. And uh, we're going to get there on Wednesday night. We'll get there at 7 to pray, 730 for service will be gone by about 8.30 or 8.45. You've got that time blocked out. It is part of your life. And it's real easy to come in, lift our hands and say, I'm ready to worship. But what about private worship? 
This writer has a fully communicated worship. He says, it's not just for me. He said, I praise the Lord. I praise Him with my whole heart, but I'm going to show forth His marvelous works. This praise is not just for me. It's for everyone to see. I want everybody to know what God's done. So he had private worship. He had public worship. Second thing we see in our division, in verse number 3 through verse number 8, we see the judgment of the world. We've got the jubilation of the writer. Now the judgment of the world. We find in verse number, uh, verse number four and verse number eight that it is a righteous judgment. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause, thou saidest in the throne, judging right. Verse number eight says, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in righteousness. You ever met somebody that felt, that felt like they'd got a, a wrong deal from God? I've talked to people like that. They say, well, God was unfair to me. It's not fair for God to demand certain things of me. According to the word of God, his judgment is not right most of the time. It's not right the majority of the time. It's not right 99% of the time. But God's judgment, the Lord's judgment in your life and in everyone's life is right 100% of the time. He cannot be wrong in his judgment. You have never gotten the raw end of the stick from God. Never have. It'd be awful hard for us to look at Calvary and think he shorted us anywhere, wouldn't it? I mean, it'd be awful hard for us to look at the bleeding lamb of God on Calvary hanging between heaven and earth for you and I and to think somehow God shorted us in judging us wrongly. So it's a righteous judgment. Secondly, in verse number five, it is a rebuking judgment. The Bible said, thou hast rebuked the heathen, thou hast destroyed the wicked, thou hast put out their name forever and ever. Can I tell you one day, this world, I know this world is running rampant right now. It seems that they're running unrestrained. It seems that there is no bride that is on the world right now but I want you to know one day the holy God of heaven is going to rebuke this world he's going to rebuke the way of the world he's going to rebuke the means of the world he's going to rebuke the, the spirit of the world and can I tell you in that day there will not be a word anyone can say about it it is a rebuking you ever been rebuked help me now somebody's rebuked you your boss rebuked you your wife rebuked you your husband rebuked you can I ask you, have you ever had a pleasant rebuking experience? <laughs> I've been rebuked. I know that you find that hard to believe, but I have. I've been rebuked a few times by a multitude of people, and I've never once enjoyed it. Not once. I, I've been, I've had people get on to me for, for a varied, uh, very varied means of things. I've never once enjoyed, but can I tell you the world will not enjoy it, but they will not be able to kick against it. When you're wrong, you're wrong. And when it's brought to your attention, it doesn't matter how much you don't like it, it's still wrong and there's nothing you can say about it. So it's a rebuking judgment. Third thing here under the judgment of the world, it is a ruining judgment. The Bible said in verse number six, O thou enemy, destructions are come to perpetual end. Or, or verse number five again, thou hast rebuked the heathen, thou hast destroyed the wicked, thou hast put out their name forever and ever. O thou enemy, destructions are come to perpetual end, and thou hast destroyed cities, their memorial is perished with them, but the Lord shall endure forever. He said is a ruin. He destroyed the wicked. And one day, certainly this is going to come to pass. It's come to pass before. Amen. You look back at the judgments that have been on the world and the judgments that are currently on the world. Do you know what it's doing? It is destroying the wicked. Now, I'm not here to get political, and I'm not going to get political, and I'm not going to go into current events and things of that nature for tonight, but I do believe many things that have happened and are happening are part of the judgment of God on a sinning nation. And a sin anymore. You say, well, it's not just happening in America. Well, America ain't the only place sin is. And there as a whole, and we'll deal with it in just a moment, people have turned away from God. And when people have turned away from God, historically, judgment eventually comes. And when judgment comes, it's bad. It ruins. It destroys. I wonder if we could call up someone who did not get in the ark and ask them how they felt about the judgment of God. 
If we could get in touch with someone who decided it's not important, that crazy preacher doesn't know what he's talking about. Rain coming from heaven, a flood taking over the earth. Man, that's crazy. What's he talking about? A righteous God is going to judge us for our sin. They laughed him and mocked him. Can, can you imagine what they thought as the heavens broke open and the earth broke forth with water and gushes of water came in? We get this idea it was a heavy rain. Hey, friend, it was not a heavy rain. There were torrents of water coming in every direction and it swept them up and as they were choking with their last breath they had to look up to heaven and say I'm being judged for my sin just as the man of God said. I wonder what we, what we would get from them about the judgment of God. I believe they'd say it was a ruining judgment. Thirdly, fourthly, it is a relentless judgment. Notice what the Bible said. Verse number seven, but the Lord shall endure forever he hath prepared his throne for judgment. How long does God's judgment last? As long as God does. How long does eternal life last? As long as God does. How long are we going to live as a people of God? Just as long as God does. Amen. You say, well, you sound like God's going to die. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying God's going to die. I'm not even sounding like God's going to die. I'm trying to get you to realize we're going to live as long as God lives. And can I tell you, everybody in hell is going to live that long too. Or can I word it more biblically perhaps? They're going to die that long. Right. Amen. Right. Always dying but never dead. Forever and ever and ever, as long as God lives, how long the judgment of God stands? The Bible said, He will stand forever. The Lord shall endure forever. And the judgment that the Lord gives out shall endure as long as He does. So we see the jubilation of the rider. Third division, we see the judge. Or second division, we see the judgment of the world. Third division, I like this, we see the joy of the worshipers. Notice in verse number nine, the Lord also will put a refuge or be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in time of trouble. The joy of his worshipers are anchored in the refuge. Can I tell you, it was a glad day in my life when I found the refuge. Hey, it was a glad day when, when God revealed to me the judgment of God was going to be passed upon me. In fact, it had already been passed upon me. I was not waiting to be condemned. I was condemned already in my sin. I was not going to be judged. I was in the midst of judgment already. And one day I would finally stand before God and and stand as a sinner if I did not get saved by the grace of God. And happy day it was when I found the refuge from the judgment of God. For the refuge was what sheltered me so the judgment of God will never pass upon me. I say bless the Lord, hallelujah, oh my soul, for the refuge that my hope is anchored in. Years ago, I read this story, and you probably heard the illustration before years ago. Uh, there was a, a, a fire out in the plain somewhere and there was a chicken running around and all of her chicks were there. And uh, when the rancher went through after that fire had passed over, he saw just a, a, a mound of ash in the shape of a chicken. He reached down with his foot and he just decided to flip it over. When he did, out from under it scurried all the chicks out from under that, that mother's wings. Say so what? They found a place of refuge in the midst of fire. Can I tell you, I got a place of refuge in the midst of judgment. I, I'm not worried about judgment. I'm not afraid of judgment. Now, you say, well, are you excited about standing at the judgment seat of Christ? I'm, I wish I could tell you I'm really excited about that. Amen. I used to hear a lot of preaching about the excitement about standing at the judgment seat of Christ, and then I started studying a little bit about it. And I'm not sure... It's going to be nearly as pleasurable as we think. Because the Bible said we're going to give an account to God. And if you've been as dishonest with what God gave you as I've been with what God gave me, when it comes time to reckon with Him, I'm not sure I'm looking excited. I'm not excited about that. Amen. When it comes time to, for God to ask me, what have you done? with all that I gave you. And I look and I go, well, I did this and, and I, I pile up a pile of works about as thick as that sheet of paper. And I lay down there. And he says, well, I gave you a whole lot more to work with, didn't I? 
All I say is, Lord, that's all I've got. So I'm not, I'm not looking necessarily forward to the judgment. I sure am glad I'm going to the judgment of Christ, judgment seat of Christ. Because I've read about the great white throne judgment. I'm glad I'm not going to be there. Or at least not being judged there. Anchored in our refuge. Secondly, the joy of the worshipers is acknowledged by revelation. Notice what verse number 10 said. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. Somewhere there's been a revelation of his name to a certain group of people. Can I tell you it was a glad day when I found out who he was? Amen. Hey, when I found out he was more than a song, he was more than a Bible verse, he was more than something I learned to quote when I was, ch when I was a child, he was more than just simply a song that I learned. Hey, I, I can't can't remember a time in my life when I did not know Jesus loves me. This I know. But I want to tell you, when I was seven years old, I found out the name of Jesus was more than a pretty word in a song. Hey, the name of Jesus was more than just something that fit in to Christian music. Uh, uh, G, the name of Jesus was more than just a word on the page of the Bible. But I found out the, the name of Jesus is the name of the Lamb of God, the Son of God that was slain for my sin. And I, when I found out who He was, I ran to Him because He was exactly who I needed. Needed. So there was an acknowledgement of revelation. Then thirdly, the joy of the worshipers was applauded in remembrance. In verse number 12, the Bible said, when he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. Isn't that a blessing? That ought to be a blessing for everybody that's ever been forgotten by anybody. I was talking with Jeb today. He FaceTimed me as we were coming down the road. Don't worry, Brother Lowry, I was not... I was not FaceTiming him. He was talking to Ashlyn. I was just listening and talking, okay? I got to tell that when we got law enforcement here, make sure they know. I was being good. He FaceTimed us and we were talking, had it coming through the car and he was telling us, I said, what are you doing, buddy? He said, well, I'm at the church here and I'm waiting on Brother Victorio to get back. I said, where'd he go? He said, I have no idea. I said, okay. He said, him and Miss Cookie's left. And then he made this statement. He said, I hope they didn't forget me. <laughs> Amen. And he said, that could never happen. You don't know Brother Vic. That could happen. And uh, Jeb's around there. He's walking around the church. And, and we talked for quite a while. And then all of a sudden he said, hey, Brother Vic's here. He didn't forget about me. He may have forgotten about him and then remembered to come back and get him. I don't know. Uh, but it sure was good when I found out that Jeb had not been left and forgotten. Amen. And if you've ever been forgotten, ever know what it is to be forgotten, you ever had your birthday forgotten, amen. Honey, I know. If you've ever had an important event forgotten, if you've ever, I heard the, somebody was telling me the other day, a friend of mine was telling me, uh, he said he saw somebody that he knows that uh, they're, they've been close to recently. And uh, they saw each other at a Gwinnett Braves game and, and the person walked up and, and then another person walked up and they went to introduce my friend. And they said, this is... Uh, uh, <laughs> I said, did you tell him? He said, no, I didn't tell him. <laughs> he said, I made him sweat it out. And uh, I laugh about it, but have you ever had that happen? The, oh, this is, um, mm, mm. and then you tell him, you know, yeah, man, I know. I'll never forget who you are. <laughs> okay, except for 30 seconds ago, you'd forgotten who I was. If you've ever been forgotten, it sure is good to know it'll never happen between you and the Lord. He'll never forget. He'll never forget you. So we see it's anchored in the refuge. It's acknowledged by revelation. It's applauded in remembrance. Then it's acted out in rejoicing. Verse number 14, that I may show forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in thy salvation. He said all of these things that God's done for me, this judgment that I'm not under, this deliverance that he's given me, I want you to know I am going to act this thing out in rejoicing. There's going to be a display of emotion when I show the world what God has done for me. So we see a jubilation of the right, the judgment of the world, the joy of his worshipers. And then let me mention this, the just end of the wicked. In verse number 15 through verse number 20, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, I'm guessing. I, and I guess maybe it's a dangerous assumption, but I am assuming the majority of us are saved. And we know that we're saved. We know we're on the way to heaven. Maybe someone here does not know that. And maybe someone here has never been born again. Perhaps someone listening or someone that will view this later has never been 
been born again, I want you to notice what the psalmist says is the just reward of the wicked. Verse number 15, the heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made in the net which they hid is their own foot taken. Can I say this about this just end? It is inexcusable. He said, you're going down in your own pit. Amen. You're sinking in your own sin. Now, we can blame family sin. We can talk about family sin. We can talk about generational sin. I believe there are truths, and I believe that if you study it out, you will find there is something to generational sin that needs to be broken. I understand that. But can I tell you, when you face God, you're not facing God on generational sin. You're not facing God on family sin. You're not facing God on paternal sin or maternal sin. You're facing God on the pit that you dug yourself. You will stand before God because of your own sin. He said it is inexcusable. He said they are in the pit that they dug for themselves and they're caught in the net that they laid for themselves. Then we see it is inescapable. In verse number 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. I get this view. We, we know that man's walking in darkness. We know that Satan has blinded them and they're walking blind and they're walking toward hell. And as they walk toward hell, I believe that there is just a natural one day, one day as they go on in their sin, the Bible said they're just going to be turned into hell. As they walk blindly in darkness without the light of the gospel, they're just going to turn around that bend one day right off into the pit of hell walking in their own darkness. It's inescapable. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Can you imagine forgetting God? You say, man, I don't know how anybody can forget God. Well, how often did you thank, the God, thank God for the air you breathed before you were saved? Amen. How often did you thank God for the water you drank before you were ever saved? How often did you thank God for sustaining, for sustaining your life before you met Him? You realize whenever you got saved, I, I was saved at, at the age of seven years old. There were seven years there that I walked without Him. Seven years I walked in darkness. Seven years I walked in my sin. Seven years I walked outside of the protection, uh, protection of the grace of God. Some of you were much older. Maybe you were 30 or 40 or 50 when you got saved. For all of those years God protected you so that He could save you one day, so that you could enjoy heaven one day. But how often did we thank God for what He did in preserving us before we got saved? We'd forgotten God. After all he'd done for us, created us, gave us air to breathe, gave us water to drink, gave us food to eat, gave us the life-giving ability, our life-living ability, and we forgot God. How often did we do that? But the sad truth is, how often have we done that since we got saved? <clears throat> we still forget God. I'm glad, that that, I'm glad that his mercy will be remembered so we see the end is inescapable. Go with me now to John chapter 12 and I'll close. We'll, we'll uh, tie this together and close for a moment. In a moment. Scared you there. Thought I was going to reopen, didn't you? John chapter number 12, verse number 46. John 12, verse 46. The Bible says, I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. If any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. <coughs> in this passage, we see number one, Christ's priority. What does the Bible say his priority is? It's not judgment. That's not his priority. His priority is salvation. That's what the Bible said here. He said, I came not to judge the world, but that the world might be saved. It's what he said in verse number 47. I, I judge him not. I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. That is his priority. His pri he came to save the world. That's what he came for. 
God gave His Son to redeem mankind. He came, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is Christ's priority. But also in this passage, we see His responsibility. His priority is salvation. His responsibility is judgment. The Bible said in verse number 48, He that rejected me, receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. Christ said, what I've said, I have said. My word stands, and I have a responsibility to be true to my word. And he said, and when I judge man, and when man is judged for their sin and the rejection of Jesus Christ, it's going to be my word that judges them. They're going to stand against the word of God. Amen. <clears throat> Let me give you an illustration that maybe will help us bring some clarity into this. Brother Larry, I hope you don't mind me borrowing you just a little bit tonight. I try not to single too many people out all the time, but I need you for a moment. So I'm going to use his name just a little bit. We have laws in the state of Georgia. We have laws in Dawson County. And those laws are there to protect us. I'll be the first to tell you, I do not like the speed limit. I never have. I don't ever plan to. I don't like the speed limit. I don't like getting on 400 and the speed limit being 65. I have a car that will go 110, 115, 125. What's the point of having a car that will do that if I can't do that? And the law says I cannot do that. I didn't say I like it. I said it's the law. Now why is it there? Because if I'm going 125 and you're going 125, which I can't envision that, Brother Richard, but it could happen. <laughs> Miss Sandy said I can't see that either. But if I'm going 125 and Brother Richard's going 125 and here comes Pam going 125, I can't envision that. I have no problem envisioning that and stopping on a dime too. <laughs> Amen. So I'm going 125. He's going 125. Pam's going 125. Here comes Ashlyn just fresh out of the gate, not been driving all long. She's now on 400 driving 125. And now there's some 15-year-old out there driving with his parents. First time he's ever been out there figuring out what the car will do. He's driving 125. Do you know what's going to happen when we all meet? Amen. There's going to be a wreck aside. And we're going to be the first ones there. Amen. The law of 65 is placed there to protect us from our own selves. Amen. When it drops down to 55, it's placed in areas because there's high traffic areas. There's more volume there, so there's more opportunity for mishaps, so they bring the speed limit down. When you come into a small town, you're on a back road somewhere, and the speed limit's 55. You come into town, it drops 45, then to 35. For some reason, 25. I'm pretty sure I can bounce off a car at 25 and it not hurt me. Nevertheless, they do it. 25, and you're going through this little town. Why is that? Because when you go through that town, there are going to be people walking those streets and stepping out and all that, and they need protection. And we're not smart enough to protect them. Because if that didn't say 25, I'd blur through that town at 55 miles an hour, and I'd, turn, I'd rip the signs off of every storefront. If that was not there, but because the law says I've got to slow down to 25, we slow down to 25, close, and we make sure that we protect. It's placed there for protection. What is the rule? What is that law there for? It is there to save. That's what it's there for. But if we neglect the law, we decide to reject the law. I don't want that law. I'm not going to let that law rule over us. I, I'm not going to let it rule over me. I'm going to do what I want to do. Do you know what is going to become not our salvation? It is going to become our judgment. That same little sign. Probably they're going to take a picture of it. When you go to court and try to fight it, you say, hey, I was going 55 because I want to go 55. I think 55 is at a reasonable speed to go, and I think I ought to be able to go 55. They're going to say, this, this particular sign has been placed at this location. It's been here for this long. It says 25 miles an hour. This is the law. Whether you agree with it or not, this is what you must do. 
And the same sign that was placed there originally for your salvation and protection is now become your judgment. And can I tell you what man is doing? Man is looking at the cross of Christ that is there for salvation. It's there to purchase them. It's there to redeem them. And man says, I want to do it my way. I want to do my own thing. I want to take it my own direction. I don't want to go by the cross. One day when they stand before God, it will be the same emblem. It will be the same person that stands to become their judgment because they decided against their salvation. His priority is salvation. His responsibility is judgment. You will not escape the judgment of God unless you come by Calvary. That is the only means. You say, well, I don't like it. I'm going to go a different way. You will never escape the judgment of God unless you come by the means provided. And the means provided are Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary and the blood He shed for sin. As we stand to our feet tonight.